When you come across counselors and psychologists and uh, counselors and psychotherapists, what you will see as they go on with age, uh, they get more and more certificates, more and more degrees, more and more uh, uh, specialties. You know, I am trained in this and this and this. I have seen people with 15, 16, 25 certificates. And uh, still many times what you will see, they have only a few clients. Why? They are trained on the top. Why is it that they would still have only a few clients? They hardly manage. They spend all this money in advertisement. They, say, they spend all these years in training. Is it because they have a bad training? They don't. When I talk with them, I realize that they have high quality training. Are those uh, certificates nonsense? No, they're very good, many of them. Are they not useful? Yes, they are useful. But see, changing psychotherapy always occurs in the context of a good interpersonal relationship. We were created to be in relationship. God is a relational God, and we are relational. And when people come to us, they usually come to us in need of relationships. Um, back in the uh, 70s, in the late 70s, there was an American Association of Christian Counselors uh, have done some research on the needs of, um, uh, I think it was Gary Collins who, who did that. There was. Uh, a research on why, what is it that people need in counseling. And the research that showed was 85% of people who come to counseling would not need to come to for counseling or psychotherapy if the church would be ready to listen to them. Think about it. 85% of, I would go broke. And so would you. I mean, 85% of our clients wouldn't need to come to see it, wouldn't need psychology, wouldn't need counseling if there would be somebody in the church listening to them, sitting down with them, becoming relational with them. And that was in the 70s, before iPhone, <coughs> before the internet, or at least at the beginning of internet. It was before um, mobile access to all Facebook and uh, all chat lines and um, any of those uh, visibility to the world, would you think that by now we are more connected? We should be by now more connected and we are becoming more disconnecting. And we are fooling ourselves believing that we are more connected because we have more Facebook friends. We need to understand the context where people come out of when they come to see us. Where are they coming from? Where are they coming from? Are they coming from uh, uh, in their 20s? Do they actually have parents who listen to them? Their parents should be in their 50s, my age. Most of you, uh, I noticed, except for two of you, blessings to you, uh, you come from the West, but the rest of us come from the East. So um, I feel honored to have you here. And please bear with us, because I'm going to use a lot of Eastern European context. Because most of us come from there. But I think that even you might be helped by understanding Eastern European context, because I think the West is just getting it. So what you are being pushed into, the wave that is coming, is the wave that we just got rid of. But at the fall of communism, what happened, that people became so excited about finances, about money, about having your own business, because up to that point, you were only allowed to have uh, a job that we, where you were employed. So my generation left their kids for financial safety and security and indulgence. 
do the kids in their 20s have a strong parenthood behind them? When you have kids in their 20s, where are they coming from? A lot of disconnection. Also, most of their friends are already growing up in, an, uh, in a time when internet is their number one friend. Uh, their number two friend is Facebook. Number three friend is Twitter. Number four friend they're searching for. How about people in their 30s? They were just at the youngest age when their parents opened up to the West. At the very uh, mark of the growth and youth, they learned that they are not as important as the new business that their parents are starting. Maybe they are a little more connected on the outside, but the majority of 30s right now, the, the greatest number of uh, singles are in their 30s. The greatest number of single people in Europe are in their 30s. And they're coming to see us because they don't know how to make relationships. They know how to make short-term relationships, but they don't know how to make long-term relationships. So here we are meeting somebody who doesn't know how to make long-term relationship. And the question is, are we going to be able to teach them with our presence? Let's go on to people in their 40s. Where are they? People in their 40s are usually struggling the most with their life. They have kids, they are trying to make finances, they are trying to manage in career, in life, in children, their parents are growing older, so they are having not two hands filled, but extra two hands. They are like octopuses, eight hands filled. It is one of the hardest periods of life. And for them to sit down for an hour with you or with me can be a treasure if we are there to sit down with them. Because there is a difference between sitting down and sitting down. People in their 50s, they are at a switch in the life cycle. Their kids are growing up and they're learning what is it like to be alone again. Maybe alone because they are divorced, because they are widowed, or because they just uh, never spent enough time with their marriages. When I look at the couples in our uh, counseling agency, we have more marital couples in their 50s, 40s and 50s, than we have in their 20s and 30s. Why? Because this is when they realize the last kids is flying out, leaving home, and they're realizing, I am stuck with you. What am I going to do with you? Because all these years I could manage life. It was a common project. We were doing it as a project. So what are we going to do now? So the people who are coming in their 50s, they have somebody by them or they don't, or they had somebody who is leaving or they didn't. And also it's a mark. You know, it's a crisis point. You lived half of a century. So how many more are you going to live? 10 years, 20, 30, 50? I encourage people to plan for 120. <laughs> My brother is a nephrologist and he says, uh, you know, a kidney specialist. And he always says that uh, for uh, kidney functionings, you need to figure out kidney functioning about 120 years. So we were planned, created for 120 years. I said, all right, that's fine with me. I always tell people, hey, let's plan for 120. But 50 is a crisis. This is looking at your life and saying, what have I done with my life? Is there anything that is stable? So come, people come with their 60s. They're already priced past this crisis. And one of the questions they have is, how on from now on? Did I lose my value because I'm retiring? Am I losing it? I, am I here now just to wait till I die? Is there any purpose in my life? 
And these are questions that you probably heard before, but what we don't think about, that these are questions that they are afraid to say. Many times they can't even say it and name it because it's not safe to name it. We live in a society where you're supposed to be happy, excited, all well. And the church, you don't go into church say, how are you? Well, <laughs> do you want to really hear it? That's not what you say, how are you? Oh, praise God, I'm well, really? Were you well 10 minutes ago before you arrived? Before you hang up the phone saying, I arrived to church, I gotta hang up now. Were you really well? See, we live in a fake world, and the internet is encouraging fakeness. And the people who come to us, they have learned from the internet that you don't represent truth. Look at the Facebook pictures, and you will know. So they come to us and say, I wish I could be real, but is this a place where I can be real? And when it comes to therapeutic relationship, that's what it's all about. And the 70s? What is the 70s about? How many of you have clients in their 70s? Okay, you do? I have a few. Most of them are medical doctors. And one of them, 75, she just said to me, she said, well, I said, how about you dream something for me. Tell me what, what are your dreams. She said, well, I need to take care of my sons this and this and this and take, make sure that my daughter gets married. And she started to read, list her responsibilities. And I said, how about next year when all is done? And she said, well, I think I'm just going to try to live peacefully. I said, try to live peacefully or wait for death peacefully? I mean, that's a shocking question, right? And she looked at me and she said, you know, I, I have many sicknesses. And I said, yes, I know. Yes, I know. But are you planning a life? Or are you just waiting for life to end? Our clients are coming from a background of loneliness and relational needs. If you think of them, they all come with relational needs. And the personality of the therapist comes first, because techniques are second. I remember when one of my professors back in the States said, ladies and gentlemen, now before you graduate, let me tell you this. You know it all, blessings. You know it all. You know all the great techniques. You have the methodology done. You have your... Uh, abnormal psychology and diagnosis and all that down. But remember, it is not the techniques that will heal. It is your presence and who you are. And I thought about it and I remember, I remember when he said that because to me it was a shocker. I, I was shocked. Who I am? Am I good enough to heal? What can I heal when I have so many things inside of me that I'm struggling with? Can I heal? Can I be a part of the healing process? And I think that's the, one of the major reasons I have been working on myself and I encourage everybody to work on themselves. Because when we work on ourselves, actually God is using our own healing process in the life of people. And on the opposite way, it is true too. I have noticed that God is using me in their lives and suddenly they start healing me. It is reciprocal. As I am working for them, their lives and their healing starts giving me hope. The psychotherapeutic techniques work much better when the relationship works. I have had clients, and one of the reasons when I go to supervision, one of the things I ask my supervisor, I'm doing everything according to the book, and it's still not working. What am I doing wrong? Just recently, I asked my, my supervisor, I said, something is wrong. I'm doing everything the way I have to. I look through all my notes. I'm asking the right question. I'm doing the right presence. I'm doing everything okay. Why? 
Why am I not able to help her? And he looked at me, he said, have you placed yourself into the situation? Or are you staying out because it is wounding you also? Do you understand the question? Have you stepped into the situation, into the counseling presence, or are you staying out just so it won't wound you? And I looked at him and I said, I'm staying out because her pain is very similar to my pain and I'm so afraid to step in and be present because I'm protecting myself. And I went back and last week I had a session with this woman and before the session I prayed and I said, God, I don't want to protect me because if I keep protecting me, I will not help her. Would you protect me so I can help her? And I went in there and I said, whatever it takes, I'm going to take the risk. And I saw exactly the, the, uh, the uh, intersections when I usually go back up and say, oh, I'm staying out and asking a nice question. And I remember looking, leaning forward and saying, you know, I know exactly how you feel. I have been there. Actually, I am right there. She changed. She changed totally. Just in one minute, she was a totally different person. And first time, after eight sessions, this ninth session was finally a good session. So do uh, techniques work a lot much, uh, much better if the relationship works? Suddenly, just one presence changed everything in the session. When two people really listen to each other, they meet. We know this. Because this encounter changes them, remodels them, even to the point of reshaping the neural, uh, neuronal, uh, I'm trying to say it again, neuronal synopsis. You know that, that uh, all the neurons and all the synopsis can be constantly changed. And it is amazing how meeting people and connecting just stay changing the whole entire brain structure. That is, oh, the first time I read about it, I actually teared up. I was probably because of my age. I noticed that uh, uh, after 45, you know, you start crying more and more often. Uh, so I warn you about that. Um, all you need is waterproof makeup. Um, when I read about this, to me, it was so reassuring and so, uh, it is like redefining our convictions about God and what God says, because he says, I am relational, and I want you to be relational. There is no other God, no other religion where God is relational. All other gods, all other religions have a God who is distant, who is far away. I am God, and you serve me. And if you don't serve me well, that's it. You're doomed. The distance is always present with God and creation in all other religions. And when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to our God, the living God, God says, I came down to be with you because I want to be in relation with you. I, I long to the time when, we were, when I created you and we were together. I long for that Garden of Eden to be back. I long that to be repeated. God says, I crave that togetherness with you. That's why I came down. And he said, I give my life for you, which is risking your pain for them. That's counseling. Risking my own pain and saying, God, you protect me. As you came down, I want to come down. But that's not what counseling and psychotherapy teaches. Most psychotherapy and most psychology teaches stay distant, stay away. Psychotherapy says, and most psychology schools say, that you have to be distant, you have to be without value system, you don't represent anything. I mean, come on. I don't represent anything, I'm wearing slacks. I represent something. I'm wearing glasses, I represent something. I'm wearing, oh, I'm sorry, I'm wearing necklace, I represent something. 
I have short hair, I have long hair, I have no hair, I represent something. Can we really be without a value system? It's a lie. Let me show you something. My father was a psychiatrist and a neurologist. He was one of my greatest teachers. And I often think back about the times that he taught me about psychology and counseling and history and the times of our age. Right after the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, it was a revolution about, against communism when Hungary was free for two weeks. Right after the Soviet army came in and uh, uh, conquered over Hungary again, and we lost our freedom, my father said there was a meeting in the Board of National Health, and he said all the psychiatrists were called in. And the Minister of Health was giving them a lecture on what they are to do. And I will never forget what my father said. He said he was screaming and yelling. He said, you can touch personalities, but we don't want identities. Don't touch character. We don't want character here. Just treat the personality, which is treat the diagnosis, but don't you ever be present. Because see, treating the diagnosis, if you separate it, and he knew it, if you separate diagnosis and try to teach it, then you will not really heal, and you will not really be present and do healing in character. But God says, I want to change character. I want to change identity. Of course, this was, this was one of the number one demands of communism. In Eastern Europe, if you were a Christian, you were not allowed to be in any psychological field. And you know that in the West right now, if you are a Christian psychologist, you're one step down compared to the ones who are believing in anything else. Claiming that you're a Christian and a psychologist, it's contradictory. But is it? If we really look into, is it? Can it really be contradictory? I think the only real people who will really understand the soul and the works of the soul are Christians. If you don't believe in your soul, if you do not know a relational God, how can you be relational and in the healing process? So what are the key ingredients for a good therapeutic relationship? Warmth is a starting point and a permanent background. But what is warmth? I have been thinking about warmth before Pablo, but I never thought about it this way. But I have noticed that my eyes feel different when I look at somebody with warmth or when I look at somebody with distance. Do you know what I, I mean? I mean, I don't know if you can write an article about how my eyes feel. <laughs> <laughs> but my eyes feel just different. I can almost say I have a curtain down in front of my eyes when I look at somebody without warmth. I'm there, but I know I am not there. And when it comes to warmth, I know I have pulled up the curtain or pulled aside the curtain, and I just feel them in here, in here. I feel them inside. Somehow, there is something about our eyes, which we will, we will talk about later, but the warmth is the presence that says, no curtains put down between us. See, I didn't say iron curtain. I just say curtain, because many times, Warmth is separating, uh, warmth is not there because what is separating us is our dogmas, is our criticism, is our shoulds, is our personal pain, our personal wounds, our personal fears. We are human and we are suffering. And we are going through the great difficulties in our own personal lives that we are trying to leave outside the counseling room. But once we sit down there 
and they come in front of us, what do we do? What do I do as a Christian when somebody comes in and say, I am having a relationship with a student of mine. He's still in school, but he's already an adult. We didn't have any sexual relationship until he turned 18. What do you do? <laughs> do you open up the curtain or do you pull down the shades? Because I feel that, okay, I want to throw you out of my room. I'm filled with anger. And it is a righteous anger. But can I let that righteous anger stop me from going through and teaching and healing and, and touching her? See, warmth can be separating us very quickly. Warmth can, uh, can be uh, changed into coldness very quickly. The question is, what are the things that I need to work on? I think one of the things that uh, the best, to be a best counselor, one of the things we need to do is constantly work on ourselves. Constantly work on ourselves. So many things I come across that I realize it is still a problem in me. I'm still critical. I'm still shaming. I'm still judgmental. I'm still distancing. I'm still afraid. Is warmth present? And I think sometimes it is just little things. I mean, in my office, I always say that I am convinced that all the darkness, all the pain can be a little bit lit up if we let beauty in. Every time I, I noticed every time I see too much pain or too, too big of a darkness, I start searching for beauty. Beauty in little things. In my office, we have in the waiting room, we have music. Sometimes it's classical, sometimes it's jazz, but we have soft music playing. It is not just elevator music, okay? Yeah. It's music. We have, I specially picked out a smell, a scent that gives them freshness and, and that will connect them to healing because our smell is one of the strongest memories and deepest memories. So I have selected specifically smell that will be connected to our counseling office. And all the rooms and all the waiting room have the same smell. And um, we have a coffee table where you can make coffee and tea while you are waiting. And you can bring it in. And you know what? Most of the time I say, may I serve you? May I make you a cup of tea? And you know, in, in Eastern Europe, I don't know how it is in the West, but in Eastern Europe, you don't make coffee or tea to somebody who is coming and paying you to see you. You don't become a waiter. And when they drank their tea, they want to bring it out to the kitchen, I say, no, 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 it's my job. Let me serve you. I cannot wash their feet, but I can still somehow touch them. See, warmth comes in little things, not just big things, not just big curtains, but once you start doing it, I believe in the Bible, in, uh, we, we read that whoever refreshes someone will be refreshed himself. I believe in it very strongly. It's one of my, my number one slogans for my life. So when I invest and I refresh people with a cup of tea, with music, in the winter time, we have candles in all the rooms and the waiting room. And you know, I had clients who came in, five years later, they come back for a checkup with, with a new problem. And uh, I set an appointment with them in the phone and on the phone, and they would come in. And when I open the door and they step in, they go, oh, that smell. And they start crying. Sometimes they just say, it's so good to be here. I have clients who would come, they know that they're welcome to come earlier or leave later and note down whatever they want to in the waiting room, what they remember. Just little tiny gestures of acceptance, of love, of saying, can I wash your feet? 
it will create a climate. Empathy and sympathy, bless you, that catalyzes. What is empathy? Empathy is the ability to experience the feelings of another person. That's the definition, but you know that we don't really have to feel it, but at least understand it and be there. Sympathy is caring and understanding for the suffering of others. And I think one of the reasons why I talked about warmth, I think one of the mistakes that we make is in counseling we are, teach to em we are taught empathy so much that we forgot about sympathy. I think one of the mistakes of counseling and psychotherapy is that we are focusing on empathy without sympathy. I hate when people, when I hear people talk about clients like a case. They are not cases, they are people. They are people whose mother was excited when they found out that I'm expecting a child. They are people who were loved. Hopefully they were loved at least by one person in their lifetime. They are people who Christ died for. And when they are in pain, I really think we should be present and let them know, I, I'm suffering with you, I am here with you. Isn't that what Jesus did? I mean, for a God, a creator of all, to come down to earth, isn't that suffering enough? In and of itself, is already suffering. To come down into a limited human body, and to try to argue with people who say, I know better. Yeah, I'm the creator. Do we see our clients with sympathy or just learned empathy? Because I believe when people start seeing us understanding their pain, that's when healing starts. I remember one of my clients, this young man kept coming to me and I couldn't decide if he's schizoid or not because he had very little, very limited, almost no facial expression. He talked with a great distance, with great coldness and very rigid body. And once he was, he came back to me and he was totally changed. Totally is an extreme word, but at least he had facial expression and so I saw some flexibility in the body. Thank you. And I looked at him and I said, how are you? And he said, oh, last time was a breakthrough. And I'm like, last time I looked through my notes, like, what did I say last time? What did we work last time? What was a breakthrough? He said, I remember when I said this and he talked about somebody hurting him how you made a facial expression that showed that your disgust is just like I am. What would counseling teachers and techniques teachers say? That you didn't hide your opinion well enough. And for him, it was the beginning of the healing process. He said, I knew you were with me at that point. First reaction was, oh my God what was on my face. I still don't remember what was on my face. But I know for him that was the beginning of a feeling process, that he saw the disgust and anger on my face. The same anger and disgust that was in his soul but was not on his face. That sympathy, the agape love, the willingness, the best, willing the best for the patient is an essential ingredient. Agape, love, will, the willing, uh, willing the best. You know, when I have clients, when somebody comes in, I always ask God something that is illegal to ask. I always say, God, give me a vision for them. You don't supposed to have that, you know that? This is something I cannot lecture in the university. Because they will say, no, 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 that's your issue, that's your agenda. And I don't push them towards my agenda. But I want, I want to have some kind of a vision of how great, how big, how healthy, how content, how thankful they could be. Do I push them towards that? No, yes. I push them towards the how, and I actually push myself, 
not to give up on them, not to be satisfied before they are satisfied. And trust makes a solid therapeutic link. Trust is an alliance. I think when you have the warmth, the empathy, the sympathy, the love, they will trust. They will only trust them. And I also think when you show them that you're real, that you're real. I remember um, when about 10 years ago, I told one of the student groups in one of the universities in Hungary, a psychology students, I said to them, I said, um, uh, as I introduced myself today, I said, you know, I just would like you to know this is who I am, this is where I got my degree, I'm divorced, I have five kids. And one of the first questions, why do we know to, why do we need to know that you're divorced? Why did you tell us? I was surprised. And I looked at them and I said, because I want you to see that I'm a real person. I want you to see that I'm a real person. Because even now, when I make the great effort not to be invisible, but to be visible, people will still say, oh, you mean you struggle? Oh, I, I thought I couldn't tell you because you have five kids and you manage them so well. And I say, yeah, and I yell at them just like you do. Are we real? Because agape love means being real, and that will give them trust towards us. Shakespeare said, listening with your eyes is a delicate expression of love. That's the look that I was talking about earlier. Listening the core of the therapeutic relationship. Learning to say nothing while we're listening is more difficult than learning to say something. Well, introverts are uh, better off in this one. Extroverts, we are in, in big struggle with this. If we like to express all of our thoughts and thought processes, we have a tendency to speak sooner and more than we should. Also, I think that we live in an age, in an era, when silence is not appreciated. But silence is a place of creation. When we are in silence, that's when God can speak. See, I think even Christians, we, we make the bis, big mistake of praying in monologues. I'm saying it, God. You listen. Amen. Do whatever you want to do with this. I trust you that you will do the best. And God says, wait, 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 Tamuk, I want to talk to you. No, no, no. I'm, time is up. I have prayed. It was a long prayer. I went through all my list. Thank you. Amen. Blessed be your name. See you later when I'm in need. But I think we need to learn in ourselves with God to have a dialogue, which means I say, and I'm waiting for you, God, to answer. Are we waiting for God to answer? And are we letting our clients to be in silence and just sitting with them? My record silence so far has been 16, 17 minutes, thank you, 17 minutes. I had this very, very strong introvert man, 38, came into my office and gave me all the diagnosis which he was given, which he is not, and sat down. And after going through some basic question, I said, how can I help you? And he said one sentence, did not put a period, but a comma. You could feel it because in Hungarian you raise your voice and you know something is coming. And he waited 17 minutes before he ended the sentence. At the first session, I remember, he hardly said anything. I mean, he said some things, but very slowly. Today we argue. Today we have conversations, but we needed to start with saying nothing. And believe me, 17 minutes, just watch your clock. It is painful, or maybe not. For them is a time to feel. And see, one of the reasons why we are so eager to talk quickly 
because when you need to just have a cognitive argument, you go very fast. You answer, you answer, you answer, you answer. It's like, you know, scandal, uh, what, what, scandalism, you know what, what do you call it? Uh, what is it? Arm wrestling. Arm, yeah, thank you. Arm, it's like arm wrestling. It's just brain wrestling. When you speak very fast with a client, you can very much be sure that the reason you are speaking so fast because they are not letting you touch their feelings. And they got you into, into a game of speaking too fast, arguing too fast, arm wrestling, brain wrestling, and they don't want connection with their emotions. Do you know how to get out of it? You don't answer their next comment, their next argument. You just listen. Look at them. Maybe ask a question and wait. And you will feel as slowly their thoughts will descend into their emotions. In order to connect emotionally, we need to slow down. That's one of the main reasons I think we are so uh, struggling so much with the listening part. Our time is up. Two more minutes. OK. If, it's, uh, if, I, if we run out of time, then we will continue after coffee break, OK? To listen is to enter, because you enter to the other person discovering what is in his, her mind and heart. I really have, uh, have been so blessed by having supervisors so far who are willing to listen. They are great thinkers. They, I respect them very much. They have a great amount of experience behind them. And, and um, uh, they, they just know so much more than I do. But it is a blessing to sit down with somebody and have them ask a question and look. And look and wait for me to discover the answer. See, to discover the emotional answer, you need silence and time. We all have the cognitive answers. But when you brain struggle, we, we, when you brain argue and brain wrestle with somebody, it is just reactions. It is not emotions. It is not feelings. It is not stories. It is not connection. It is nothing else but wrestling and keeping you away from the emotional part keeping you away from the depth. Listening says, I am with you and I am for you. You hear with your ears, but you listen with your eyes. Try it. Try it next time. Your eyes feel different. You actually somehow, you open up more. You know, I, I have my first two degrees in music. I used to be a singer, and I, I, my major was voice and harp. And I remember when my teacher told me, Emilka, if you really want to sing well, you need to ground yourself, which means have the connection that you are you're safe and, and strong. So you ground yourself. If you think about opera singers, you right away, this is how they stand, right? And then she said, sing through your eyes. And I said, sing through my eyes. Woman, my voice is here. She said, no, no, sing through. And singers, we know that we need to place the voice like this from back up through our eyes. Because if you think here, then you just swallow the sound. You swallow the air. But in the minute, you sing through your eyes. And I often think about it. We sing through our eyes. And we hear through our eyes. We listen through our eyes. When you are listened to, you feel understood and loved. And before our coffee break, I want to tell you, my father died very suddenly nine years ago. And I called my best friend. And I said, Edith, dad died. And she said, what happened? And I told her. This was late in the afternoon, close to the evening, when I was able to call her. 
And I said, I gotta go because I need to put the kids to bed. I need to cook dinner and I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do that, just too much. And as I was doing the house chores and taking care of the children and cleaning up the kitchen, the doorbell rang. She traveled three hours to come to see me. In the minute she hung up the phone with me, she got into the car, asked her husband to take care of her, the kids, and she came. She came to see me and I couldn't believe it. And she hugged me and she was just holding me and she looked at me and she said, let's put the kids to bed. And she helped me clean up the kitchen and get ready for the evening. And then she closed the kitchen door and there is a small couch in my, uh, the, where I usually have my coffee, it's just a two-seater. And she sat down, made the tea for me. And she sat down and she looked at me and she said, tell me. And I remember it was nearly midnight when I noticed that as I am crying and I'm talking nonstop. She was going like this. And I looked at her and said, Edith, uh, you're too tired, you traveled so much. Why don't we go to bed? And she said, it's only my body. I'm listening to you. Don't take anything to bed with you. I will never forget that. Because that healing began, took my grief healing began with her listening. She did not say a word, not a single word. And sometimes, a couple times, she looked at me and she said, I'm sorry, Emilka, I don't know what to say. I don't know what is the best thing to say. She didn't need to. She just needed to be there. <laughs>